Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 291, featuring the first in a brand new interview series of Mr. John Cutter, a veteran of CinemaWare and Dynamics. In this part of the interview, we talk about his early days, including his time at GameStar, making some of the early uh, sports titles. Uh, we also talk about why he likes the game Mule so much, what was so special about the Commodore 64, we talk about some of his CinemaWare stuff, and the betrayal at Krondor versus betrayal in Antara controversy. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. John Cutter. Hi folks, I am here with the great John Cutter, employee number one at a company called CinemaWare, which I'm sure you've heard of if you had a, an Amiga when you were growing up. He's worked on classics uh, such as Defender of the Crown, TV Sports, and uh, one of my favorites, King of Chicago. Uh, he's also worked for New World Computing and Dynamics, where he uh, was a lead designer on Betrayal at Crondor. He's uh, also served nine years as the creative director at Big Fish Games. How are you doing today, John? I am doing just great. Thanks, Matt. So I was wondering, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but what sort of projects do you have in the pipeline, or you know, what's in what's in your future? Well, I actually left uh, Big Fish Games uh, just recently, and I'm currently taking a little bit of a break from game development and hoping to get back into it pretty soon. Actually, considering uh, maybe looking overseas, I think that'd be kind of a fun adventure at this this point in my life. So you haven't have any plans to launch one of these Kickstarter projects and try to resurrect a title? Uh, you know, actually, Neil and I had thought about that for Betrayal at Crondor. Um, unfortunately, the rights for uh, for Ray's Universe were tied up by some other company, so that we, we weren't able to make that happen. You can always go back to Antara, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you heard the whole story on that. It was It was kind of interesting. Did, did uh, maybe in Neil's interview, some of that came out? Uh, maybe I'm sure I would have something I would have asked about, but I'd always be uh, happy to hear your side of it too. Well, my side of the story was that we we launched Betrayal at Crondor. Uh, it initially was not a huge seller for Dynamics, um, and then they did a, a CD-ROM version of the game as we were starting uh, kind of the sequel. Um, I I pitched the uh, sequel and and a budget to um, uh, Tony Renke, who was the uh, CEO at the time. And unfortunately, Tony didn't like how much the sequel was going to cost, and he fired me. So uh, the CD-ROM version went ahead, we finished, or the company finished that up and launched it, and all of a sudden, Betrayal at Crondor started winning, you know, FRP of the Year Award and Game of the Year Awards. And I think um, before that happened, I think Ray actually went to Sierra and said, hey, can we you know, kind of get the rights back. And they said, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not planning to do more sequels. We're not doing anything else with it. Um, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll give you the rights back. Um, and then the game went out and started selling like hotcakes and started winning all these awards. The company tried to hire me back, but I had already started somewhere <laughs> yeah. else. And Somebody I, had to eat some crow over that, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the meantime, Ray took uh, the rights to his universe and made Return to Crondor with a company called Seventh Level. Uh, and Sierra, Sierra Dynamics decided, hey, well, we want to make a sequel as well, but we don't have the Crondor license anymore. So we're going to take the word Betrayal, and we're going to do Betrayal in Antara. Um, and it was, both of those games were made with, with completely different teams from, uh, from the original title. Although uh, Neil and I did consult a little bit with Seventh Level on Return to Crondor, which was a lot of fun. All right, well, let's talk about your, your early days, John. What, okay. I was reading some stories, uh, found some other interviews, and, of course, looking at your uh, that really nice, what would you call it, the portfolio, I guess it's yeah, you? The portfolio blog website. Uh, blogolio <laughs> that you put together there. I was uh, kind of interested, I uh, wanted to hear a little bit more about these uh, Dungeons & Dragons campaigns uh, that you would run. I was read that you... Uh, you like to play the game, but I guess when you were playing, you kept thinking to yourself, "I'd rather be making my own rules and you know making my own sort of role-playing game system." Uh, have you always had that that sort of itch? You know, you play a game and somewhere you're burning uh, 
to stop playing and start making? I mean, <laughs> uh, it's are, are they are they opposing forces? Yeah, no, it's 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 terrible actually because I can't enjoy games anymore. If I if I'm playing a game that's just sort of mediocre, I'll play it and I'll finish it. But if I'm really really enjoying the game, I get so inspired I don't want to play anymore. I want to go make something on my own. And yeah, we used to do that with um, with Dungeons and Dragons back in the day. Is uh, I, I was in love with the idea behind Dungeons and Dragons but when I first heard about it. Uh, it was just you know this this whole idea of playing a game you know with your friends kind of in your head and you're making up you know in my mind you were sort of making up some of the rules as you go along and it was all this big fantastic uh, kind of role playing adventure. But when I actually tried to play the game, I realized there was a great big thick rule book and tons and tons of stats and numbers and. And I was not as much into that as I was, you know, the creative part of it. So I just kind of came up with my own rules. I simplified things a little bit. Um, I, I remember thinking it was more fun to sort of let players roll the dice uh, rather than sort of rolling it behind a screen. And, and I know that some of the newer uh, role-playing games actually, I think, will do that. You know, I would tell my friends, oh, my gosh, you know, you, you just uh, you, you've fallen into a pit. And to escape the pit, you need to, you know, look at your dexterity, and you need to roll a seven or higher on, on these two dice. And then I would give them the dice. So there was kind of this dramatic moment where they're shaking the dice, and then, yes, I got a nine, and then they'd be real excited, rather than me sort of quietly saying, okay, you climb out of the pit. Yeah, I think your way sounds a lot better to me. Uh, do you uh, remember any of those any of those uh, stories you created or campaigns? Not really. I, you know, I always loved the puzzles. Uh, that was a, a kind of a favorite part of mine. Um, and I think it was actually those puzzles that inspired the, uh, the, the lock chests in Betrayal of Frondor. Because uh, I loved riddles. Um, and I was trying to figure out a good way to get riddles into the game. And we had talked at one point about possibly doing a console version uh, of Betrayal. And I thought, I can't do a riddle if we're going to have a console. You don't want to be typing something in with the, with the controller. Um, and that's when I thought, well, wait a minute, what if we put the, the answer to the riddle on little tumblers and then allow people to just tap on the, on those little tumblers. And the, the side benefit of that is I think riddles are kind of a binary thing. You either, you know, you think about it for a second, you either get it or you don't get it. And if you don't get it, there's not really, you know, unless someone's willing to give you clues, there's no, there's no help. There's nothing you can sort of figure out or puzzle out on your own. And fortunately with our, uh, lock chests, players could actually kind of see what the letters were and at least start kind of start to get an idea of what the answer might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll never forget. That's probably the only role playing game uh, that my wife would come in and, and ask me to play. She's like, can't you play, uh, play that game again? The one with those chests, <laughs> <laughs> you know what it was, I'd be playing along and I get to the chest and you know, I would just say, Hey, come in here and, and she'd sit down and figure this out. And sometimes she'd spend, you know, hours, you know, I don't know about hours, but anyway, you know, a lot of time trying to, to guess that, and that was, uh, I thought it was kind of neat. We heard that story so many times. Uh, you know, I'd be out at, at a store or something, and, and someone would find out that I that I designed Betrayal at Crondor, and I can't tell you how many times somebody would say, oh my God, my, my, my wife, every time she heard the puzzle music <laughs> come on, she would run in from the other room, and we would sit there together and try to solve the riddles. So I thought that was, that was interesting. That was fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I was also reading that one of your favorite games is Mule, uh, and I was wondering kind of uh, what you liked about it, but also I was wondering if you had ever met the designer of that game, uh, Danny L. Bunton Barry. Yes. I did get to meet uh, Danny once. It was at a GDC, and uh, somebody that, that knew her was coming out of a... Um, I was with them, and Danny was coming out of the conference... And, and I saw her, and he said, oh, you want me to introduce you? And I was like, yes, please. And so we got to chat for a few minutes, and, of course, I just probably looked and sounded like a raving fanboy and didn't make much of an impression. But, yeah, Mule, Mule was a great game. And, I, and I've told people in the past that Mule was really the game that convinced my dad that, that game development was actually a viable career. Um, he was, you know, I was, I was a senior in college, uh, was studying radio and television broadcasting communications, but I was spending most of my time playing games and designing games, thinking about games. And my dad used to get kind of angry at me that I was not focusing on, on, you know, uh, on my career and, and thinking more about the, the, the stupid games. 
And they were out visiting us uh, for Christmas. What did your dad do? Just don't want to. He was a petroleum you. engineer, pretty conservative guy. Oh. Uh, is well, he, he's still alive. Uh, he was a petroleum engineer. Um, he, he, they were visiting. My my parents were visiting for Christmas, and my wife had picked up a copy of Mule for the Commodore sixty four, and I somehow convinced uh, all all three of them to play. And so we sat down on the couch, the four of us, my mom, my dad, my wife, and I, and we played that game for hours hours and hours and just laughed and we would we would cry we were laughing so hard my mom had a hard time controlling the mules trying to get them into the pub and into the little uh the the areas where you would outfit them and you know she was ooh, 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 ooh. we had a, yeah we had a great time and my dad never gave me a hard time about game development after that. <laughs> i think he finally got it he understood why i liked games so much yeah i remember with that game the you always had that little race at the end to get back to the gambling it yeah. was at the pub the pub, yeah. Before the timer ran out. Yeah, it's such a great game. You know, I don't think, to, to my knowledge, it's never really been remade. No. In a, I mean, I guess people have tried, but just none of the remakes I've played have really uh, lived up to the, lived up to it. No. They, they never captured the magic of that original game. Even simple things like the fun music as the characters would march back in and climb up the screen and you could see who was winning. And it was just, it was magical. I, it was a genius game design. So I guess playing Mule is what got you. Is that what got you interested in uh, compu uh, programming computers? I guess you had a Commodore 64 that you were learning how to program on, right? I, I did. My very first computer was a, a Timex Sinclair 1000 with a little chiclet keypad. And I taught myself to program in BASIC uh, on that. Uh, and I started writing little games for my friends and I. Uh, but it only had 2K of RAM in it, and I was running out of room. So... I went out and spent $49.99 on a 16K RAM expansion unit, which was about this big, and I plugged it into the back, and I never ran out of room after that. It was 16,000 bytes. I couldn't <laughs> believe how much memory that was. Of course, now that's a JPEG on a website about that big. So what was it about the Commodore 64 that attracted your, your interest? Uh, I think it was just the... the, the the, it was. It felt like a serious computer compared to the Timex, which was very small and hard to type on. Uh, it had a the, the Commodore had a real keyboard. Um, of course, it had sprites. It had better graphics. It was just a, an all around better system. Although when we first bought it, we didn't have the disk drive. We just had the little cassette tape recorder. So it would take about twenty or thirty minutes to load and save anything that I was playing or working on. Yeah, I can't imagine what that would have been like trying to program and having to wait yeah. <laughs> so much. I guess you had a lot of time to to make coffee or something as it yeah, was. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I just trying to. Im how old were you at this at this point? Let's see. Um, I was a senior in college when I when I bought the Timex Sinclair One Thousand. Uh, I graduated with, uh, with again with a degree in communications, radio and television broadcasting. Um, and then I got a job as a disc jockey at a radio station in Ventura County, California. I went to school at Pepperdine, uh, mm -hmm. in Southern California. And uh, I was working the midnight shift, and it was boring, boring, boring job. Uh, I had worked in when I was in high school. I had worked at a radio station right out of right out of high school. I just lucked into a a job, and I could do voices. I was writing little. Uh, you know, scripts and, and stories and could play whatever music I wanted within, you know, certain guidelines. Just had a great time. Uh, and then I went, finished my school, got a, a job, you know, out of college now. And my first job was at this station, midnight to six, and all the music was on these big reel-to-reel -reel tapes. So I would, I would hit a button, play three songs on one tape, then I would switch that tape out for another one, hit a button, play three songs on that one. And every now and then I would say, Rock K Star FM ninety six, and that was my job all night long. Wow! And that was the point where I actually got into into computers and computer games. Um, unfortunately, I would come home at about six thirty seven o'clock in the morning, uh, have breakfast with my wife. Uh, she'd head off to work and send me off to bed, but I would get up and start playing with the computer and messing around with it. Totally lose track of time. It'd be about 3.30, and I'd go, oh, my gosh, i got to get back to bed, and I'd run jump back into bed. She'd come home about 5.30, thinking I'd been asleep all day, would wake me up so we could have dinner together, and then I would drive in at 11 o'clock at night you know, back to, back to the radio station and would be falling asleep on my way into work. That's how bad it was. 
I'm just impressed that you taught yourself machine program or machine language on that thing. I mean that that seems like a pretty serious uh, undertaking. Yeah, I was I was quite proud of myself. Uh, I there was a, a company in Santa Barbara called GameStar, and I was talking to those guys about a little tool that I was working on that would allow you to redesign uh, character sets and then place them down on the screen, so you could make you can make scrolling games that way. Um, and they uh, were going to publish, possibly publish that tool, and then decided, you know what? I went out one day, and they said, um, we don't want to publish this after all. We'd like to use it internally, and we would like to hire you as as a junior programmer for $27,500 a year, and I just about had a heart attack. Was that more than you were making as a DJ? I was making $400 a month as a DJ. (laughs) Yeah, it does not pay well. So yeah, I was I was thrilled, and that was kind of my entry into the games industry. So who who were you working with at, at GameStar? Anybody that we would recognize? Uh, Troy Linden, um, who went on to work with Left. Uh, he let's see, he was involved with the uh, John Madden uh, football games. Um, he was at a company with a guy named uh, Mike Knox called Park Place Productions, and they did a they did a bunch of work. I think they were. Entrepreneurs of the Year or something uh, there for a while. Uh, Scott Orr was actually the guy that started GameStar, and he went to Electronic Arts, and I think was kind of uh, one of the major players in their sports division. So when you were at GameStar, you were making games like Star Rank Boxing, uh, GBA Championship Championship Basketball and Sports Games, uh, now, I think you had said somewhere that you and your dad like, like to watch a lot of sports, right? Yeah. So it wasn't like you were coming into this. <laughs> I talked to people before uh, that worked on sports games, and they had never even, they didn't know anything about the sport going into it. But it sounds like that wasn't the case with you. Uh, I knew a little bit about sports. I was not, um, I don't think you would, anybody would hire me today to work on sports designs other than golf. I was, uh, I was a, a golfer on our um, a college team. And I still play from time to time, although not, not as much as I used to. But no, I was uh, I, I watched football. I was one of my favorite memories when I was a kid was watching Monday Night Football with my dad. You know, with Andy Don Meredith and Howard Cosell, and uh, mm-hmm. that was those were some great memories. And so I knew a little bit about football, but but not a whole lot. Um, yeah, that was a strange. GameStar was a strange company. They had this this niche back at a time when people didn't really have or need uh, niches. Uh, they just did sports games. Did they do pretty well? I think they did okay. Um, and then they got bought out by Activision, and that's that's when I left the company. And um, shortly after that is when I started at Cinemore. What happened after Activision bought them? Uh, I think I actually wound up getting laid off. I don't think I was running uh, product development, basically, at GameStar, and they had people at Activision to do that. Uh, so I went off, and uh, I heard about this guy, Bob Jacob, who was a software, trying to become a software agent. And I pitched a game to him, and he made a bunch of promises about how excited he was he was going to sell it, and then nothing really came with that. And then uh, a few months later, eh, maybe six months later, he called me up and said, hey, I've started this new company. I want to hire you. I want you to be the guy. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And he said, no, well, just, just come talk to me. Just come talk to us. Uh, so I thought, well, all right, I can't hurt anything. And I talked to my wife. And my wife was very skeptical. Uh, Bob kind of had a reputation for being uh, kind of the player a little bit. I mean, he was, you know, a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. Um, and she was concerned, uh, quite concerned, actually, about me taking the job because you just didn't know that he had the right reputation. It wasn't really going to go anywhere. And so I, 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 I went down there, and Bob let us in. They actually had an office, which was nice. And Bob let us into a little room, a little dark room, and he took out a floppy disk and put it in an Amiga. And I had not seen an Amiga up to that point. I put the floppy disk in, and after a few seconds, he turned the lights off. After a few seconds, the Defender of the Crown title screen came up, you know, with the light sweeping across the metallic letters. And I, I had never seen anything like that before. And I am not kidding. Within half a second, my wife leaned over, over to me and whispered, Take the job. And I did. <laughs> Says your wife a gamer? Or she is she doing a computer work at that point? No, uh, she actually did some voices uh, for us at, at Cinemore. Uh, I think she might have been the love interest in Rocket Ranger. 
Um, she does. She does like to play games. Um, she'll play pretty much the same stuff that I do, other than more hardcore first-person shooter type games. But we play MMOs together. Um, she plays a lot of casual games. Uh, so I'm kind of fortunate that way. I know a lot of people out there. Their significant other isn't a gamer, and it makes it kind of tough sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that can make it tough sometimes. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about this just reaction that you had. I mean, it's just a title screen. I mean, it might be hard for people today to really appreciate, you know, a shock, the shock you must have had. What was it about it that just mesmerized you? Well, I mean, you have to remember that state-of-the-art back then was, you know, it was Apple IIe and, and Atari 400, Atari 800, Commodore 64 graphics which were very limited in colors, and I think, I think the pixel density was, was a lot less than the Amiga. Uh, and, and even people that were making some of the early Amiga games were using the same artists that they were using for their Apples and Commodore uh, titles. And, and a lot of those guys were just programmers that, that kind of knew how to draw. Um, Jim Sachs was, I mean, I've been in the industry for 32 years making games, and there are only a few people I've met that I can just flat out say, that guy was a genius, and Jim Sachs was is definitely one of those guys. Uh, the artwork that he did at the time for Defender was just there was nothing like it at the time. Uh, I mean, it was it was a beautiful image anyway, even without the the light sweeping across the the metal letters. But the the sum of all of that with the stones in the background, and I, again, I had just never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. I was blown away. So was my wife. Yeah, I just remember how beautiful the castles and everything were in that game. And I was thinking at the time, you mentioned that it's the first time you'd seen an Amiga. I remember around that time we got our Amiga 1000, my neighbor, he had some type of PC. They had spent thousands of dollars on it. And he was he was just blown away by the fact that his PC had color. Yeah, <laughs> He's like, hey, you know, it's like EGA graphics, and he was showing yeah. me games like uh, Police Quest and Leisure Suit Larry. And I brought him over, and like, look, I got something I want you to see, you know. So he came in, and we I put in Defender of the Crown, and we just watched the whole title, you know, the whole title sequence. The whole time, he's just, he, I, I could tell he thought that I was trying to pull one over on him somehow. Like maybe I had a, a VCR connected to it or something. I mean, he just could not believe uh, that the, that box was putting those graphics onto the screen. Oh. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I do that now. Um, I can't remember which game I was playing, but. I was playing a, a, a role-playing game not too long ago, and I, and I stopped moving for a minute because I was in this really beautiful area. The lighting was incredible, and the, the trees, and the buildings, and, and the characters. And I sat there, and I just looked at the essentially the still image for a second, and I thought, it wasn't that long ago that if somebody had told me that that was just a digital painting that somebody had done, I would have been blown away. But it wasn't a digital painting. It was actually 3D modeled, and I could move through that world. And it just it just boggled my mind. It's it's incredible how far we've come. I hope one day I can get uh, Sax on onto this program to talk talk to him because, you know, I do think that there's some. I don't know what to call it exactly. A, his spirit, I guess, or his sort of character comes through in his his artworks, and you know, yeah, it's pixelated, but. That doesn't really, I still consider it to be art, Yeah. right? I mean, I could uh, take any of those paintings, uh, I guess you could call them paintings, <laughs> uh, that he did for those games and, and put them up in my house somewhere and, and admire it. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, he actually got started, I think, on the Commodore 64 doing art. And rather than using an art tool, um, and I don't remember what people were using at the time. Of course, we, we used a Electronic Arts D-Paint which was a phenomenal tool. Um, but there was another art tool that people used to use, and it didn't give him enough control over the pixels and the colors and everything. So he actually took a piece of graph paper and wrote down every single pixel, what color he wanted it to be and what you know how it related to the surrounding colors and pixels. And, and that's how he did some of his early art, which even on the Commodore 64 was pretty incredible. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a second slice of this interview with Mr. John Cutter. Believe me, we have a lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. 
As always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you from the very bottom level of my heart for your support of this show, my efforts at preserving video game history and interviews with the video game legends like John Cutter. So thank you very much if you have supported me. If you haven't, uh, just please go to the Patreon site in the uh, links or the notes in the show. It only takes a couple of minutes to set that up. And whatever amount you think the show is worth, what you can afford to support the show at, that is fine with me, and I really, really appreciate it. So, thank you. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? So what do we have? what do we have here? Uh, a couple of fun news items, and I'm not uh, quite sure what order to go in, so I'll just go with the order that I have written these items down. Uh, first off, I actually have been interviewed. Uh, the Saint Cloud Times, the city newspaper here, swung by to talk about the gameplay movie, also Mad Chat. I uh, haven't seen the article yet, but hopefully that will not be a, a, a negative piece. At least we can hope. Uh, so I'll pass that on. Also, I'm doing a text chat with these guys, and I think it's invitation. Uh, it's just open to everybody. So as soon as I get the link to that, I will post it. I guess I'll go ahead and put it in the show notes too, uh, along with the time. So if you'd like to participate in that, uh, you can. Uh, but anyway, I think that will be exciting. All right, some other news. Stig uh, just wrote in to tell me about the Baldur's Gate 2. Uh, they're coming out with two expansions for that, and they've just completed the voice work. Uh, for these expansions. Uh, I really haven't had enough time to uh, look into these expansions, what exactly they're planning. I don't even know if they've, well, what's been officially released and what's just speculation at this point, but uh, if you know anything about this, uh, please uh, update me in the comments. Uh, also, there's a lot of news this, uh, <laughs> this week. Uh, uh, Nathan, I, you, you know, I just had my 10th year anniversary, and I guess it's to kind of, uh, kind of as a gift for that, Nathan and Becca, a long term, long time uh, fans of the show as well as personal friends have sent me or sending me the ACA 620 uh, kit for my Amiga 600. Apparently, this is a dramatic uh, speed boost, it has a lot of cool features to the uh, Amiga 600. And uh, so, anyway, as soon as I get that in, I'm going to install it and I'll make a little video about it uh, for you guys uh, that are into Amiga and modding and all that kind of stuff. I'm really looking forward to it. Not really, I haven't really done a lot of modding myself, so. Uh, it'll be an experience. A uh, little news item here. Hideki Hakiyawa of Konami has said that the company will now focus only on uh, mobile games. <laughs> Apparently they are just uh, warming up to the idea, I guess, of iPhones and whatever as the future of gaming. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, okay, what else do we have? Oh, if you didn't read about this, it's kind of upsetting, really, but they're... Uh, there was a Kickstarter project up um, for a game called Dimension Drive. It was a shooter game. And apparently what happened was, uh, you know, they'd been struggling to reach their goal. And then right towards the end, somebody stepped in with a 7,000 euro, euro pledge, which of course put them over the, their, their limit. Uh, they were all excited and everything. And then it turns out this guy was just a troll. It was a fraudulent uh, pledge. And so that was a, a really bitter moment for them. You know, it's really terrible that somebody would, would do something like that. Uh, I think we'll know where they will <laughs> go after they have left this earth. All right, uh, David Craddock, you know, you might remember I interviewed him on the show a while back. Uh, he's coming out with a new book called Dungeon Hacks. It's a history of the roguelike. He sent me a review copy, but I can't say anything about it yet, apparently, but uh, I will. Anyway, I really like what I see so far. Uh, that book is out, going to be out on uh, June 29th, I think is the official release date. Uh, so I'll have more to say about it later, but just thought I would put it, out, put it out there now so it can be on your radar. If you like uh, roguelikes and reading about them, I think you really like Mr. Craddock's work. And uh, David, by the way, he also is an author in the uh, Retro Magazine that I talk about from time to time. So uh, yet another reason to subscribe to that magazine if you haven't already. All right, the final bit of news here. Uh, there's a new Nancy Drew game out, Sea of Darkness from Her Interactive. Uh, this one is set in Iceland. 
Uh, my wife and I have been playing that, having a lot of fun. It's definitely uh, one of the more challenging games, I would say, in that series so far. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, <laughs> Sea of Darkness. So go check that out if you're into adventure games and or Nancy Drew. I think that will do it. Whew, man, that's a lot of news. You know, I think I deserve a very choice ale of the week. Let's hope this is a five horn beer. It is the uh, one from Stone, which uh, I picked this one because <laughs> some of you guys are a little upset sometimes when I just go with the local brew, the Minnesota stuff, because you guys have a hard time finding those. Uh, Stone, though, is out of uh, Stone Brewing, and I think they are out of uh, uh, San Diego, California. So if it made it all the way from San Diego to St. Cloud, uh, you shouldn't have any trouble finding it uh, where you are. This is a an Old Guardian barley wine style ale. Huge fan of barley wines. And I like uh, oak. Uh, oak smoked. Not quite sure what I'm going to make of that, but uh, it sounded interesting. 2013 odd year release. 11.4% uh, alcohol by volume. Uh, so definitely on the stronger side. Uh, well, they have a huge write-up about this I'm not going to uh, bother with. Uh, let's see, a little something here at the bottom. Ingredients. Tons and tons of barley, bountiful hops, water, and yeast, and an odd dose of German oak smoked wheat malt. Oak smoked wheat malt. It's kind of fun to say. Oak smoked barley wine style ale. Anyway, it looks great. I'm really uh, excited about trying this one, so let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Old Guardian Oak Smoked here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, smells really nice. You get some of that, uh, you can definitely smell that smoked uh, aspect to it. It's a, kind of a cherry, um, little charred uh, aroma that you get from the, I guess that's from the oak barrels or whatever they use to get that smoke, smoky uh, aroma in there. Not overpowering though, it's got a nice a sweet aroma too, a little bit of a, a uh, I guess it's mostly the uh, the sort of cherries is what I'm smelling, uh, the cherries and the uh, smoke from the oak smoked part of it. Anyway, it smells really good. Definitely a thick head on this one, I probably poured it a little too quickly, got a little excited I guess to try it, uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's see if I can taste this. Well, that'll get your attention. <coughs> you definitely taste that smoky flavor. Um, I think I got mostly the foam that time. I'll try it again, but uh, just from that taste, I'm already tasting a very powerful uh, a flavor on this. You definitely taste that the oak smoke part. Uh, you smell a, a lot of uh, bitterness, but also a lot of sweetness with sort of a cherry uh, flavor. Uh, not surprising considering how the uh, aroma went, but I'll try it again here. See if I can get some of the, uh, get away from this head here. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's like when you, you first taste it, you think it's going to be really nasty and bitter and sort of smoky. Uh, but then as soon as it gets in, uh, as soon as it goes down, it's, it's nice and smooth and sweet. Uh, you can taste the, uh, the, how shall I put this? The, the smokiness and the bitterness are, oh wait, what's happening there? Okay, so the smokiness is, uh, you know, the, this flavor keeps evolving here. And this, let me shut up and try it one more time. I try to <laughs> say something coherent about this. All right, so what we have here, it's a very strong, very, very strongly flavored ale. Now what you taste going down, you get hit with a, a lot of bitterness right away, and you get sort of that, that smoke aroma, but then it quickly goes away, and then that's replaced with some kind of sweet flavors, a little bit of a coffee, cocoa-like uh, flavor there. Uh, a lot of cherry. Um, it's really an interesting brew. It's definitely not something you would chug. Of course not. You know, this is something you want to very carefully sip on. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, I like the, 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 the amount of flavor here. I've got to say, I'm not really crazy about the, the smoky part as I thought I might. Um, you know, it just kind of catches me by surprise. Uh, I like the... Uh, same thing with scotches. I'm not a big fan of these smoky uh, scotches, so I guess it's not real surprising I wouldn't care for the uh, oak smoked uh, ales either. I don't, I'm not saying I hate it, 
Just, uh, you know, every time I taste that smoky flavor, it kind of catches me by surprise. I guess I'm just not used to it. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me see. What to, what to judge this one? You know, I'm going to say uh, I really like it. It's definitely unusual. Not a huge fan of the smoky things, I guess, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to knock it for that. It <laughs> clearly says uh, oak smoked on the label there. And so if you don't like the smoky flavor, you shouldn't get the ale, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and go a five out of five on this, even though I've got a little bit of a, you know, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the smoky stuff, but, uh, you know, I, if, I, if I did like that, I think I would really enjoy this, this ale. So five out of five. They do a great job with those flavors. Lots of stuff going on. Very complex, uh, sophisticated brew here. Uh, so I recommend it. All right. Whew. Jesus. Uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was, uh, you know, I've been trying to get Jim Socks, uh, Sachs onto the show. And we talked about him a little bit in this uh, video. Uh, but anyway, he had me thinking about art and pixel art and all this kind of stuff and realism, ar uh, realistic art and so on and so forth. So I found a great quotation that I think you'll enjoy uh, from Aristotle. And this doesn't really sound like something Aristotle would say, but uh, anyway, here it goes. The aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but rather their inward significance. See you guys next week. Funny thing is, my father was a nun. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He was so, sir. I know, because whenever he was up in court and the judge used to say occupation, he'd say none. <laughs> <laughs>